Good evening, everyone. I'm Sergio Lara Bercial, co-founder of the iCoach Kids Global Movement, and I'm based at Leeds Beckett University in the UK. We are going to kick things off by talking about the power of good coaching. Whether it's coaching at the professional or the grassroots level, or advocating in the public and private sectors, good coaching is something that all of our panelists believe in. Coaches can make all the difference in a kid's experience with play and sport. This is especially true for kids who face more barriers to participate. Girls, kids from underserved communities, and kids of all abilities. We also know that kids are more likely to love playing and keep playing when they connect with their coaches. And now, especially in the current times, adults need, adults need tools to motivate, empower, and inspire kids to reach their full potential. And that's why we are absolutely delighted to welcome Nike to the iCoach Kids family and to announce a partnership that will allow our message and movement to reach new heights. Together, we are developing a suite of coaching essentials. Let me see if I can show you those. There you are. <laughs> uh, a suite of coaching essentials, five online modules um, that we are designed to help more people, especially those who have never coached before, become great volunteer youth coaches. Our five coaching essentials modules will help coaches create a fun, inclusive and safe environment for all kids, regardless of gender, background or ability. Principles that I know our guests believe in and want to discuss. So without further ado, let's introduce the panel. Jill Ellis was the coach of the United States women's national soccer team from 2014 to October 2019. In that period, she won two FIFA Women's World Cups in 2015 and 2019, making her the only, sec only the second coach in history to win consecutive World Cups. Jill currently serves as an ambassador for US soccer and is working with the Federation to raise the number of female coaches in the US at all levels of the game. Our next panelist is Huda Lukili. He's a grassroots coach and a former Dutch youth kickboxing champion whose career was cut short due to an accident. However, turning that setback into a strength, Huda now works as a professional consultant and public speaker, leveraging her social pedagogical background and time in the ring to inspire her audiences. Next, John Bales. John Bales is the president of the International Council, Council for Coaching Excellence, the world's largest community of coaching organizations. He is a leading expert in coach education and development, global sport and coaching systems, and sport organization management. And finally, last but not least, Caitlin Morris is the general manager of social and community impact at Nike. Made to play is Nike's commitment to getting kids moving through play and sport. Caitlin leads the Made to Play global portfolio, which emphasizes coaching as well as increasing the participation of girls and kids from on the set. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. How's everybody? Give us a wave. <laughs> Very good. Listen, let's crack on. Um, the first question that I have for you today, it's a pretty open question to all of you. OK, so what I'm going to ask you to do is if, if you can share with us the first time you witnessed the power of good coaching, whether that was as a player, as a coach, or as a parent, what was your takeaway? Who'd like to go first? Give us a nod. Go. There you go, Caitlin, you go first. <laughs> so, you know, even though I spend all of my professional days thinking about how to create early positive experiences for kids in sport, my first real observation is very personal as a parent. My son, Nathan, around the age of six, announced he was terrible at basketball. So you can imagine it was a little bit of a, a battle to get him to participate in the youth league at eight. Um, but with some, peer, some friendly peer pressure, he showed up. I was worried. And then I met his coach, Coach Brooks, and I wasn't worried anymore because Coach Brooks really knew what a good coach needed to do. And a good coach needs to see every child celebrate their contribution and encourage teammates to do the same. So while Nathan had already decided he wasn't going to shoot a basket for the benefit of the team, his coach celebrated his defense. And of course, when they did the sort of the compliment circle at the end of each game, his more assertive teammates celebrated how well he passed. 
uh, and and you know he felt great, and it's testament to that coach that he stayed in that in that league for three years. I should sort of then quickly say, since now he has found his sport, he's a fencer. That a great coach knows you have to make parents part of the extended team, because as the saying goes, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I think that great coaches not only focus on keeping the kid at the center, but making sure that the parents do too. Fantastic, Katie. And I'm, I'm gonna take one thing you said there, celebrating every child. How important is that? It's fantastic. Okay, so who's gonna share next an experience of a, the power of good coaching? I mean, I can. Hi there, everybody. Go ahead, Jill. All right. Um, first of all, hello to the global audience. It's. Uh, it's so great to, to be a part of this and, and thank you for involving me. Um, so I was probably the person who influenced me the, the most, even in my choice of a career, was my father. Um, he was my first coach and I, was, uh, I wasn't able to play sort of organized football or soccer in England, but when we came to America, my father uh, started an academy. And so every day during the summer, 10 weeks of summer, I would go out and I would, like to say my father is a masterful teacher. It didn't matter if he was working with six-year-olds or 20-year-olds, um, you could see that they were fully engaged. I think the, the capacity for someone to engage them in their learning process, it helps make a great coach. And my father would, um, he would just be relatable and he would involve them. And um, he would, he, every gain, he would celebrate every, um, every step that these, these children or these, these uh, players took in their journey and get really excited. He was very animated. And I think the other thing my father, uh, his mantra for his academy that he started was uh, winning is to learn. And so he just philosophically embraced that it wasn't about the trophy, it wasn't about the medal. It was really about this development, about this growth, about getting one day better. And, and uh, I think children found that contagious and I always say the, the mark of a good coach is if your player wants to come back to training the next day. And um, my, my dad's players would flock back and, and be excited to take one step further in their development. Wow, so much to, uh, to go through there, Jill. Uh, fantastic contributions that are around. I love a masterful teacher, okay? Someone that can really engage people in the learning process. Uh, winning is to learn. Um, making sure they come back. I mean, uh, that, that's so important. And, and, hopefully over the over the course of today's conference we're going to touch on so many of those things thank you so much i'm going to go come to to huda next huda uh, <laughs> give, give us a bit of your experience of, uh, of great coaching what what did great coaching look like for you yeah um of course my mother is also a good coach but um uh, i want to talk about uh, kickboxing today uh, when i was 11 years old uh, i started kickboxing and i was uh, facing some some personal challenges as, as a teenage girl and my coach uh, was the person who was always there for me, encouraging me every step of the way. And his uh, positive way of coaching and the personal encouraging, sorry, the personal attention uh, that I received during my uh, training helped me to bring out my confidence and strength in every aspect of my life and overcome many challenges in and outside the boxing ring. So looking back, he was a, a such strong role model in my life, uh, someone to encourage, support, and inspire me to be the best version of myself. And he was also the person who showed me the power of positive coaching and actually inspired me to choose this path for myself and do the same uh, for others. And, and Huda, that's, I mean, you've touched on a couple of things there that are really close to my heart. The idea of the coach being influential, not only in the ring, but outside of the ring, really, really being someone that can support you through your journey through life. And in your case, really, when, when you were a teenager and, and the challenges that you faced at the time. So that, that, that is so powerful. And, and, and again, I'm sure we're going to get onto that later on today. Um, and I love the idea of positive coaching that we, we, uh, I was actually listening to a podcast around positive psychology this morning, of all things. And when you said that, uh, just really uh, made me smile because it's so important that we keep a positive outlook all the time. Uh, thanks, Huda. I'm going to move over to John. Uh, John, give us your, your first experience or, or something that really you can remember around the, the power of good coaching. 
Yeah, so first, thanks, Sergio, but uh, what an incredible network we have with us today. This is really outstanding. Um, yeah, at a personal level, my first coach as an 11-year-old in canoe kayak was Herky Jordan. He, he loved the sport. He loved working with young children. He was patient, fun to be around, and we all just developed such a dedication to him and to the sport and developed that love of sport that I think really can grow at that age. So he was an excellent teacher, and I think that's such an important element of being a good coach with children. And he's a tremendous influence through my whole life. I still look back to those days. And, and that's amazing, really, that uh, when the coach is someone that, is, that actually loves the sport and communicates that love, that's when we get people to work very hard and fall in love with the sport. Really, is is uh, someone said to me uh, a while back that you you can't really force people into excellence. You have to love them into excellence, and and, and that's a great example, John. Um, so again, so we've we've touched on on a, a really big number of things in in this first uh, quick answer. So I'm gonna go now one by one, and I'm gonna ask you some further questions individually. Um, to keep building this picture of, um, of what youth sport really can can do and, and what the future may look like for youth sport. So, Jill, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you really, um, and perhaps building on on what you were saying about your dad. Uh, and again, I'm, uh, sorry before before you go, I, I was really really uh, happy to see that there was a, a positive relationship between your dad and yourself, even if he was your coach, because yes. that's something that uh, for a lot of parents it's a difficult thing because they end up having to coach their teams um, and, and it makes things hard because you're coaching your own kid and, uh, and it's a difficult situation. So that it was nice to hear that your dad was able to manage that situation really well, which I sometimes don't do very well with my own <laughs> children. Okay. Um, but anyway, what did you think is the, uh, what did you believe is the ultimate role of a coach? You know, what, what do coaches really do? Yeah, I, I've actually been, I've, I've thought about this a lot and I've been, I've been asked this question many times and, I kind of summarized it by saying, I think uh, coaches are caretakers of dreams. You know, it's this, it's this idea that we are, you know, it's a service industry, right? In terms of we, we're trying to give and ultimately what you're trying to do as a coach is you're trying to take someone's hopes and dreams and goals and bring them to fruition in some capacity, you know, in some meaningful way, try and assist this young person on their journey, on their pursuit of whatever their goal might be. Um, so that's kind of how I sort of summarize it in terms of a role of a coach. But, you know, I think in terms of what we do, I think it comes down to three things for me. It's about caring, it's about teaching, and it's about inspiring. I think those are the three sort of cornerstones for me as a coach, you know, I think first and foremost, you know, especially when you're working with young players in their formative years, it is about connecting with them. And it's about feeding their passion. I think when you're working with young people, it's not probably the over coaching of the X's and O's and the, the tactics and the technique. It's about wanting them to love the game and fall in love with the game. So I think, you know, ultimately it's as a coach, you have to know and understand who your audience is and care about them as a person. You know, when I was working with, with the senior players um, last summer, it, to, to know them outside of just being athletes, to show that they were people that you wanted to work with you knew them more than just as soccer players you knew them as people i think that's very important in terms of the whole picture of a coach you know i think the teaching element um as players start to get older and they start to sort of matriculate into maybe a specific sport then certainly i think that you you owe it to these young people to to arm them with the skills and the tools to help them be successful or at least help them grow and develop. So I think then at that point, it's making sure that you are a good teacher of the technique. And I'm and when I mean technique, technique at the appropriate time, it's making sure, you know, sometimes I've gone out to, to fields and I've watched little seven and eight year olds and the coach is trying to teach them a really specific, intricate set piece and you're kind of like, it's got to be age appropriate. And so I think the teaching part is, again, it's knowing your audience, it's understanding, you know, what is going to resonate with them, what do they need? And certainly for the younger players, it is this idea of making sure that they are fundamentally sound in their base techniques, but all the while having fun. I think that's the art of, of being a coach. And then the inspiration piece as a coach, um, you know, you're, I think one of the things that's great about sport is, 
it's not easy and there's challenges and there's pitfalls and there's highs and there's lows. But I think one of the things that's important as a coach is that you help people understand where those highs and lows fall into their development. Meaning, you know, even with, uh, even with struggle and hardship, you can inspire as a coach to make sure that they understand that that is a part of their learning process. So I think as a coach inspiring, you know, with my, with the senior women's national team, it wasn't about going out and being rah, rah. It was making sure that they felt comfortable and confident that they had the skills, that they had each other's backs and they were prepared for this moment. And that was one of the things that, you know, I would share with them and I would share with young players. You are, you're built for this, you're made for this and go out there and enjoy it. Even if it's as big as a World Cup final or your first little soccer game, uh, it really is about living in the joy of the moment of playing sport. Uh, you said something there that is absolutely beautiful. One of the most beautiful phrases I've heard for a long time, this idea of being a caretaker of dreams. Uh, it gave me goosebumps when you were saying it really, um, because actually what, what a be, we don't normally, we, a lot of the times we talk about coaches uh, sometimes not being recognized and particularly volunteer coaches don't have, don't get enough recognition for the work they do um, but even if we can ourselves just think of ourselves as, as caretakers of dreams that's a great recognition even if we can do that just just by ourselves um, and I, I love the other point you made about the uh, the fact that things have to be age appropriate uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of the times we uh, where we go wrong is when we're trying to to, to feed these seven year olds something that is, is just not, 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 they're not ready for that. Um, I, if, if I may ask you just a, 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 another quick question there, you talk about inspiration a lot, and I have to come clean with you here, okay, because I think I've watched your Netflix documentary three times in the last, uh, but uh, talk a bit more about this idea of, you know, inspiring people, even particularly when, when things are, are a bit rough, really, when, when things are not going well. Yes, I mean, I think first and foremost, it's it's acknowledging that you know, it just just like life, uh, sport reflects that in terms of the 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 hard pieces are actually what make the good pieces happen, and so I think the the tough moments, um, it's not letting those moments sort of cripple you or paralyze you. It's you know, it's it's understanding that those moments are necessary for this continued growth. I mean, I think ultimately all of us probably on this on this call today understand that it's the moments that have stretched us and challenged us and stressed us. Those are the moments that have actually been the, probably the biggest moments of growth. And I think that's important to remind young people that, you know, I tell them that Abby Wambach, who's one of our most iconic players ever, she got cut from every youth national team, that Megan Rapino has had three torn ACLs, that nobody lands on top of the mountain, that it is a climb, it is a journey. So I think when I talk about, you know, people finding their passion and, and finding their inspiration, it, it really is about, you know, what it, what lights them up, what gets them out of bed every morning. And it's, and it's finding that, you know, one of the things I say to parents, they're like, oh, you know, how can I help my kid? And especially kids that are playing a lot of different sports and the parents say, you know, should they specialize? And I said, no, just feed their passion, whatever that might be right now, just feed their passion uh, and support them. And to your point earlier, it's not to coach them. It is to support them and encourage them um, because the sport itself, life itself will deal us enough challenges and enough um, setbacks and, and moments of growth that parents should be there uh, alongside just being supported. And that's interesting, really, because uh, uh, one of our jobs really either as a coach or as a parent, and I think there are lots of similarities between being a coach and being a parent, uh, is that, that we, we have to let them fall and we just have to be there to help them, uh, to support them getting back up, really. And and obviously, uh, I think back to your point about being age appropriate, the size of the fall has to be considerate of the age of the child, OK, um, because we don't want to really throw people in the deep end like that. But we, we don't want to be over, too overprotective, really, or, or, or do too, you know, do everything for them. Um, fantastic, Jill. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm going to move uh, to Huda. Huda, uh, you really, um, your, your face really lit up and you smiled when you were reflecting on the impact of your, of your coach when you were younger. Um, so explain a bit more, you know, what was it that he did? To, to be able to put your needs first, to really be so, so centered, so, so centered on, on what you needed to really. What did your coach do to be so focused on helping Huda? Yeah, 
Um, as I mentioned, I was uh, going through um, a rough time back and then, and I think um, one of the things I appreciated most was that my coach pretended, uh, never pretended or ignored my personal circumstances. So he was also the one who really helped make uh, me comfortable with my choice of wearing a hijab during, during practice. This was a, a huge issue for me. Uh, and I often felt embarrassed uh, talking about it when I was so young uh, with people uh, because I was the only one uh, wearing the hijab uh, in the gym. Um, and it was all, uh, also uh, very difficult to keep it uh, in uh, one place. <laughs> um, and I always had to fix it with elastics and tape. Uh, and at, at one point, I was even worried uh, I would have uh, to give up um to not play sport anymore um and another example of my coach is when we were struggling to pay contribution and there were uh, no grants available he still let us play and that was so important for me and for my siblings and uh, my coach yeah however uh, was so understanding and supportive and helping me through all these difficult uh, moments and always encourage me to push through and not give up and uh, yeah that was so important for me and he um how can i say that he um he really showed me the power and difference that personal attention can have on a kid's experience and per perception of sport that's why I think it's so important that children and especially those from other backgrounds from in certain communities or difficult, difficult backgrounds uh, get a chance to have a positive role model in their life. Uh, in my case, I want to help girls in the same way because I strongly believe that if you can see it, you can be it. So talk a little bit more about your role now. Uh, how, how are you using everything you learned from your coach and also from your personal experience and circumstances as a young girl trying to, to, to do sport? How are you using that now uh, in your day to day to help others? Yeah, it's yeah, it's for me so important to uh, to create a safe place for the girls um, um, where they have uh, respect from me and from the other uh, girls and other coaches. Um, I have uh, chosen to give extra attention um, to focus more on the girls because I've experienced they, they, that they need a different approach. Uh, compliments are not always uh, giving and that is something uh, I want to do. And maybe, yeah, do you want to talk more about this or <laughs> I can, uh, I, I, I can I, do I, it yeah. for an hour? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I do want to talk more about this, really, because it's really interesting. And, and, okay. and I, was, I was really keen, you know, you said something that you said that, again, gave me goosebumps was my coach never ignored my personal issues. And, and I think that's great because a lot of the times I think that as coaches, we feel that our job is to teach people the sport. Uh, but I have this little catchphrase that I use all the time with my students where we say we have to build relationships before we build skills. OK, and it seems that that's what your coach did, that he was constantly focused on on building the relationship with you uh, that, that to support you as a person, really. Is that is that the case that your coach, your coach saw you as a person uh, before seeing you as an athlete? Yeah, yes, that's right. Um, um, I can give you an example. Um, uh, I, uh, I can give. Um, that the girls I coach at the Islamic uh, primary school this year can choose to sport with their hijab, okay? And yeah, maybe sure. not all the coaches say, okay, it's okay to sport with your hijab. And um, they have, and I had uh, certain conditions um, that I happy to meet. So my condition was also to wear a long trouser. And if the girl want to uh, uh, to play gymnastic with long trouser, it's for me okay. And um, when uh, what I do, what I have learned from my own coach is um, when I go with them to other sport clubs, um, I make sure that there uh, there is a female coach because for the parents of these girls, it's very important. Um, 
and I also make me um, make sure that I'm accessible. So when parents want to talk with me from via WhatsApp or something like that, that's possible. So you make it easy. You make it easy to get them involved with the sports. And that's what I learned from my coach because he, he did that with me. And now I can do that with the, the girls who I'm coaching. Brilliant, Huda. So really, really about keeping keeping the, the person at the forefront, really. Thanks, Huda. I'm going to move over to, to Caitlin, really. And, and Caitlin, I need you to, to, to really tell me why is coaching important to Nike? What's it got to do with Nike? It's got everything to do with Nike, Sergio. Uh, you know, at Nike, our mission statement is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And we're probably one of the few companies where we have a corollary on our mission statement, which is there's an asterisk that says, if you have a body, you're an athlete. The problem is fewer and fewer children today believe that. You know, whether you're my son at six announcing that you're no good at basketball, or most eight to 10 year olds are deciding at that point whether or not they think of themselves as athletes. And having that positive relationship with a coach is a game changer. It will make or break whether or not they decide to stay in sport. So sport isn't going to thrive if we don't have coaches out there making it thrive with kids. And so, you know, I've heard so much from Huda, who's been such a wonderful partner um, to Nike already around sort of the importance of having a relatable role model. And for us, that training is almost sort of, it's the, the, the beginning and the middle and the end of the whole experience. So what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that when you care, uh, that's great, but caring is only the first step. You need strategies. You need strategies to be able to make sport fun for kids of all abilities. How do you get the kid who's best on the court to also have fun, as much fun as the kid who's just learning how to play? You need strategies to organize yourself when you've got 20 kids you've never met before. How are you going to form those relationships if you don't have some sort of gut, some sort of, sort of roadmap to get you there? And we've actually had a lot of experience in our commitment to training and developing coaches through our own employees. So Nike Community Ambassadors, we sort of we lead from the center here. Nike Community Ambassadors are retail employees who go out and, and volunteer in their own communities to coach. But much as people assume that because they're Nike, they're sport. And I one of the great experiences we had was a, a young group of retail employees going to a PE class in Seattle. And the PE teacher saying, great, you're here, bye. And they're also they're there and they've got 20 kids or 30 kids, they have no idea what they're doing. And that was before we created Nike Community Ambassador Program where we train all of these ambassadors to go out on, on the basics of emotional connection, adjusting games for all abilities. And we now have more than 5,500 coaches around the world doing exactly that. And because they're from the communities, they are often reflecting the kids they're serving. So whether that's, whether that's from the diversity lens or from a, from a girl's lens, we know that around the world, far fewer coaches are women. We need more Jill Ellis's in the world. Um, but but all, girl, all girls need a chance to have a relatable role model. And so we've also sort of worked on not just the training piece directly, but also how do we build tools for the field? So one of the things we did is we worked with experts and community program partners around the world to create the coaching girls guide as an example of, hey, we, our, our job is to partner with others. Team impact is a team sport. And how do we sort of fill the field, fill gaps in the field with things that we think are necessary? It's also why we're so excited, excited to partner with iCoach Kids who clearly have a leadership place in this space, but what can we do together so that coaches don't just feel trained, but they also feel like they have a community, that that peer support, it's hard to be great on your own. And how do you have that network of peers who can help you and encourage you in your own journey? And, and it's amazing really because uh, you mentioned caring is not enough, really. Uh, you have to have some strategies. Uh, and I yeah. think that's where, where we come together really nicely, okay? Because we have some of those strategies. And, and like, like you say, with your, with your own development programs, uh, that's the space that we're in as well, where we, we want yeah. to make sure that, you know, we've got, uh, 2,000 people with us today, right? And, and, and they all have, they all care and they all have some strategies. And we just want to add to that, um, if you want that arsenal of strategies really for everybody. So that's a fantastic um, uh, 
a fantastic addition to to our family, obviously. And and you made me laugh as well because uh, when you said you got thrown in there uh, with twenty kids, and I remember those days. You know, you know when I started coaching twenty odd years ago, and the first time I went into a primary school, and they just threw me in there with thirty kids. Uh, in the middle of Manchester in the UK, uh, and, and with, with my Spanish accent, and I was terrified. Okay, um, and 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 I wish I had some of those strategies already in my bag, which I didn't at the time. So hopefully that's that's what we can do. Thanks, Caitlin. I'm I'm gonna uh, move over to to John now, and 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 John, uh, the question for you is is it's, it's a bit complex, really. But what is the current picture? What do we know about the volunteer youth coaching workforce today? Yeah, so there is some excellent research out there now. So we are learning more and more about really what the current reality is for youth coaching um, throughout Europe and around the world. Um, first of all, an interesting uh, fact is that coaching is the largest workforce in Europe, that there's over 9 million people coaching within the EU which makes it the largest workforce bigger than teaching or doctors. Um, so it is a very big workforce, but it's also primarily a volunteer workforce. So the vast majority of coaches within Europe are volunteer and most about half come from states that don't have any regulations or requirements. So it's very open entry but not a regulated profession at this point in time. There's some excellent coach education programs out there, but again, they don't differentiate, and there's been several comments around this, that they don't really differentiate about uh, across the different contexts. And as we know, and as comments have been made, that coaching high-performance athletes can be very different from coaching children. And so I think that's one of the real reasons why I Coach Kids is such an important initiative to really provide more of those tools and ideas specific to coaching children. And one other thing we know is that women are underrepresented in coaching. They're very underrepresented at the high performance level. Only 11% of Olympic coaches are women, even though 50, almost 50% 50 of the athlete pool at an Olympics is women. But even at the developmental level, women are underrepresented and it varies across countries and certainly across sports, but about 30% of coaches are women at the developmental levels. So again, there's a lot of work to be done there to make the environment inviting and supportive to encourage more women to coach. Thanks, John. Um, uh, it is really, uh, it's fascinating when you look at the fact that it is really the, the largest workforce uh, and, and it is completely unregulated if you want in, in, in many countries. Um, it really puts it into perspective, really. Uh, and and we're going to start bringing the uh, the panel to a close. We've got three minutes left. And, and I wanted to, again, have a, a final question to all of you. Um, we've got uh, nearly 750 people with us right now, plus the people on YouTube and everybody that's going to be watching this uh, on the YouTube channel over the, over the next few days. Um, if you could ask everyone in the audience to, to do one thing, to help improve um, a child's sport experience, what would that be? And and I'm going to start with Caitlin. Okay, Caitlin, what would you? What would be your one thing that you would want people to to do? I think the one thing I would focus on is making sure that you're creating an inclusive space. There is no reason why any child shouldn't be able to participate. And so, when you see one sitting on the sidelines, ask yourself why, and what can you do to bring them in whether that is making them feel welcome, whether they wear the hijab or not, whether it is changing the game so that different abilities feel like they're still co competing at a level that's interesting for them, but just make it inclusive. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, so inclusivity, Huda, what would it be for you? What would be the one thing for you? Um, 
we cannot forget the importance of parents in coaching. Uh, parents are more involved than uh, they used to be sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good thing, but it's also a skill to manage their expectations. Um, as a mother, I also find it important to know how my child is doing at the sports club and therefore also give uh, this opportunity to the other parents. Uh, parents need to see you as a role model. And they want to identify with you. Uh, you need to have uh, respect for their culture and respect their needs. Um, so, yeah, that's. I think that's very important to to not to don't forget it uh, to involve the parents also because the kids can't say, "Okay, mom, I'm going to the sports club." No, mom or dad, uh, yeah, are very important. Thanks. We also we got inclusivity and parents, and we've got a minute to go. So, John. You've got 30 seconds. What's your takeaway? Yeah, for me, I think it's really making it fun, making sure that the kids want to come back for the next practice, for the next season. And what does it mean to make it fun? I think it's about social interaction, being with their friends, and about getting better, about improving their skills. So those are important aspects for the coach. Thanks, John. So making it fun, Jill. <laughs> wrap it up yeah okay um well i think as a coach it's it's important to sometimes remember why you fell in love with sport and so think about that when you go to your audience uh, who your, your young players remember what brought you to the game remember what you love about the game and make sure those things i think sometimes especially in this country we see coaches over coaching it's do this do this step here play here put and so sometimes we have to remember that element of free play and allowing the players to make decisions and not over coaching them in that environment. Sure, technique's fine, safety's important, but also remember why you got and fell in love with the game. Thank you. Well, all four of you, we are on time, or thereabouts, a minute out. Okay, great job. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, John and Caitlin for your work driving more people into coaching. Uh, Jill and Huda for your work on and off the field and for being incredible role models for, for all coaches, but especially for female coaches. Have a great rest of the uh, conference. and.